Hello, thank you for joining me today on this series that we're doing called God's Final Message. Let us open up with the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day that we can come to you in prayer. Lord, we ask that you fill us with the Holy Spirit so we can fully understand today's topic at hand, the beast from the sea. Lord, open our ears so we can hear your voice through the scriptures that we are going to cover. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. During the next few sessions, we're going to talk about some very important things in the third angel's message. The third angel's message that's in Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So today we're going to talk about the beast that is mentioned in the third, third angel's message, which is the beast of the sea that is in Revelation 13. Then, the next session we'll study about the second beast that Revelation 13 mentions. That is the beast of the earth. After studying these two beasts, we will then study about the image to the beast. And after that, we'll study the number of the beast. So we have some very important topics coming up. So you shouldn't miss not one of them, okay? So in order to understand the beast of the sea, we need to go back to the four beasts of Daniel 7. Speaking of Daniel's dream of four beasts coming from the sea, Daniel chapter 7, verses 4 through 7, The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and as a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up on itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus it unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. It has been long recognized by students of Bible prophecy that the four beasts of Daniel 7 represent four consecutive kingdoms that arose in the course of history, beginning in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar. History proves that the lion represents the kingdom of Babylon from the year 605 to 539 BC. The bear, the bear symbolizes the kingdom of Medes and Persians from 539 to 331. The leopard denotes Greece from 331 to 168. And the dragon beast represents Rome. Now, interesting enough, we will notice that this four beast that represents the Roman Empire has four stages of existence, having four consecutive periods of dominion. The first stage, the Roman Empire ruled from 168 to 476. We see this first stage mentioned in Daniel chapter 7 verse 23. Thus he said, the four beasts shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from the other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it into pieces. This monstrous animal that Daniel saw represents the fourth and most powerful kingdom on earth, following the others. It is different from the other three because it will crush any country that, stand in it, that stands in its way and tear it to pieces. In verse 23, it is the beast on its own, without horns. This beast on its own rules from 168 to AD 476. 
Now let's go into the second stage, where Roman Empire was divided. This rule was from 476 to 538. This is mentioned in Daniel 7 verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. What do the ten horns represent? The ten horns represent ten kings or ten smaller kingdoms which we will that will come up and rule the same territory that Rome ruled over. This is the second stage of the beast ruling. First it ruled by itself. Then we are told that ten kingdoms came up out of this kingdom. Scripture says that Rome was to be divided, which is exactly what happened to Rome in AD 476. The text is clear. In order for the ten horns to arise from the kingdom, the kingdom must have already existed before they arose. History proves that the Roman Empire was carved up and divided among the barbarian tribes who invaded from the north. Now for stage 3, Papal Rome during the 1260 years, which is from 538 to 1798. This is mentioned in Daniel chapter 7 verses 24 and 25. Daniel 7, 24 and 25 say, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. So far we see three stages of Rome in Daniel 7 verses 23 through 25. The beast ruling by itself, that is the Roman Empire. The dragon beast with ten horns, that is the divided Roman Empire. Then among the ten kings came up a little horn, which ruled a time and a times and a dividing of time. Prophetically speaking, that's 1260 years. So what does this little horn represent? We're going to go through 10 characteristics that clearly identifies this new power. 10 characteristics that identify this power. The first one, it rose after the 10, as mentioned in Daniel 7 verses 23 and 24 exists after the dividing of Rome in AD 476. The second characteristic, this little horn power rose among the ten, as Daniel chapter 7 verse 8 says. Daniel 7 verse 8 says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Third characteristic, this little horn rose from the dragon, as mentioned in Daniel 7 verses 23 and 24. If this little horn came from the dividing of Rome, among the ten divided kingdoms of Rome, and rose from the dragon or Rome, is this little horn Roman? Of course, this power is Roman. It rises from the head of the fourth beast. The fourth beast is Rome. Characteristic number four. He would uproot three horns, just as Daniel 7 verse 8 says. Daniel 7 verse 8 says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, but before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Characteristic number five. This little horn power spoke great words. Just as Daniel chapter 7 verse 8 says in verse 25. Daniel 7 verse 8 and then 25 says, And behold, in this horn 
were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Now let's go to verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, which Revelation calls blasphemies. Characteristic number six. This little horn power would persecute the saints. Just as mentioned in verses 21 and 25 of Daniel 7. Daniel chapter 7 verses 21 and 25 say, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Verse 25, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Characteristic number seven, this little horn power ruled for three and a half times, just as mentioned in Daniel 7, 25. Daniel chapter seven, verse 25 says, and they, speaking of the saints of the Most High, and they shall be given into his hand unto a time and times and the dividing of time. This equals to 1260 days, but in prophetic time, a day equals a literal year. So this means that this little horn power ruled and persecuted saints for 1260 years. Characteristic number eight, this little horn power thought he could change God's law. This little horn power, characteristic number nine, also thought he could change God's times. Just as mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Daniel 7, verse 25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. Characteristic number 10. It would recover its power before the end. Just as Daniel chapter 7, verses 26 and 27 mentioned. This power has two time periods in which it rules, in the past and in the future. Now back to the question, what does this little horn power represent? Well, based upon the characteristics that we were given from Scripture, this little horn power can only be one. There's only one power that fits every single characteristic that we just went through from Scripture. Do you know who this little horn power is? Do you want me to tell you? The little horn spoken of in Daniel 7 is no other than the Roman Catholic Papacy. Now, just to make sure, let's go through the 10 characteristics to see if it, each one of them fits the description of the Roman Catholic Papacy. The first one, did the Roman Catholic Papacy rise after the dividing of Rome? Yes. Did the Roman Catholic Papacy rise among the 10 horns? Yes, it did. Did the Roman Catholic Papacy rise from the dragon or come from Rome, the fourth kingdom? Yes, it did. Did the Roman Catholic Papacy uproot three kingdoms? Yes. They were the Herulus, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. They were uprooted because they didn't agree with the papacy's theology. Did the Roman Catholic Papacy speak great words against the Most High or speak blasphemies? Yes, they do. Blasphemy is someone that claims to be God on earth and claims to be able to forgive sins. And these are things that the papacy has claimed. Did the Roman Catholic papacy persecute the saints? Yes. Did the Roman Catholic papacy rule and persecute the saints? for 1260 years. Yes, from 538 to 1798. Did the Roman Catholic Papacy think it could change God's law? Yes. We will study this in a future session that they have removed the second commandment, 
which forbids idolatry, and they also split the Tenth Commandment into two. So they can still appear to have Ten Commandments. Did the Roman Catholic Papacy think it could change God's times? Yes. One of, the th one of the times they changed was the day of rest, from the seventh day of the week to Sunday, the first day of the week, which they said they had the power and authority to do so. And we could spend so much time studying on how God's times were changed. But to briefly touch on this, God's times also applies to prophetic time. God's prophetic time is how God says things are going to take place. And if I had more time, we could discuss about the Counter-Reformation, which were two opposite points of views of interpreting prophecy, pointing to when this Antichrist was to be on the earth. One interpretation of when the Antichrist rules was given by Jesuit Luis Alcazar that said that the Antichrist was fulfilled in the past with Antiochus Epiphanes. This is called preterism. The other interpretation was given by the Jesuit Francisco Ribera, who said that the prophecies about the Antichrist will be fulfilled in the future. This is called futurism. God's prophetic time was changed to the past and to the distant future with Preterism and Futurism. So the last characteristic. Will the Roman Catholic Papacy recover its power before the end of time? Yes. Just as Daniel chapter 7 verses 26 and 27 says, which is stage 4. The fourth stage is when Papal Rome is restored to power after 1798 and before the second coming of Christ. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7 verse 26 and 27. Daniel chapter 7 verses 26 and 27 says, But the court shall be seated and they shall be taken away his dominion, the little horn's dominion, to consume it, to consume and destroy it forever. Verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. Is the little horn power going to be ruling before Jesus returns? Yes. The fourth stage of the fourth beast is implicit if the little horn's dominion will be taken away and will be destroyed when Jesus comes, then it must be ruling the world again at that time. This means the papacy's career did not end when it lost its dominion at the end of the 300 and a half prophetic times. It will be alive, well, and ruling the world again when Jesus comes and will be destroying by the brightness of his coming, just as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and 8 say, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him who is coming after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So let's summarize the four stages of the fourth beast. We have the first, the fourth beast alone, Imperia Rome, from 168 to 476. Then the second stage, the fourth beast with ten horns, divided Rome, and that is from 476 to 538. The third stage, the fourth beast with the little horn ruling for three and a half prophetic years, Papal Rome's first stage from 538 to 1798. Now the fourth stage, the fourth beast when the little horn 
is restored to power. Papal Rome's second stage in the near future. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 through 10 where we will see parallels to Daniel 7. Even a, 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 at a quick glance at Revelation chapter 13, 1 and 2, it reveals a clear link with Daniel 7. The same sequence of powers as in Daniel 7, only it doesn't call the power the little horn. It calls it the beast. Let's see this in Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 13, 1 and 2 say, Then I stood on the, sea of the, the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So, do we have the same beasts mentioned in Revelation 13 that we've seen in Daniel chapter 7? Yes, we do. From John's point of view of time, who wrote Revelation, he is going back in time, in the timeline, starting with the beast with ten horns, to the leopard, to the bear, to the lion. Also mentioning that the dragon gave this beast his power. From Daniel's point of view, he's looking forward in time on the timeline, starting with the lion, to the bear, to the leopard, and to the beast, who then had ten horns power rose from. The little horn is the same as the beast, as with the dragon beast of Daniel chapter 7, the fourth beast. The dragon beast of Revelation 12 and 13 also has four consecutive stages of dominion. The first stage, from Revelation 12 to 13, Rome, the dragon who sought to kill Jesus. It was Rome that was in power then. Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 and verse 4 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head and she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Now let's go to verse 4. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now the second stage is divided Rome, where the dragon has ten horns, as mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold the great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Third stage is Papal Rome. The beast received its power, throne, and great authority from the dragon and ruled for 42 months. Just as Revelation chapter 13 verses 4 and 5 say. Revelation 13 4 and 5 says, And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. 42 months is the same as 1260 days, which is the same as 1200 prophetic years that the little horn ruled. Now, let's see another parallel from in verse 7. Revelation 13 verse 7 says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Are the activities that the little horn and the beast do 
the same? Yes, they are. The little horn and the beast perform the same activities during the same period of time. We also notice that, just like in Daniel 7, there is a second stage for which the little horn where they will be ruling when Christ returns. The same for the beast in Revelation chapter 13. That's stage 4. Papal Rome. The beast will rule again after the deadly wound is healed. Let's go to Revelation 13 verse 3. Revelation 13 verse 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. It will be noticed that the beast, which received its power, its throne, and great authority from the dragon, performed the same actions from the same time period as the little horn. Revelation chapter 13 verse 5 and 7 says, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Let's go to verse 7. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now let's focus on the fourth stage of the dragon beast. It is important to underline that while the fourth stage of the dragon beast was only implied in Daniel 7, it was made explicit in Revelation chapter 13. For we are told there that after the beast ruled for 42 months, it will have another period of dominion. In between these two stages, the beast is recovering from this deadly wound. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 3 again. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been, had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So, there are some crucial, crucial questions that we will be covering speaking on this deadly wound. The first question, with what weapon? was the beast wounded? Second, what does this weapon represent? Third, how and when did the beast acquire the weapon? What is the meaning of the deadly wound? What keeps the deadly wound from being healed? When and how will the deadly wound be healed and by whom? First, let's cover the weapon that wounded the beast in Revelation 13 verse 10, which explains what weapon was used to give the deadly wound that ended the dragon's third stage of rule in 1798. Revelation chapter 13 verse 10, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. So, what was the weapon that was used? It was a sword that the beast used to kill. The same sword that the beast used to kill was also used to give the beast a deadly wound. Now, someone might object and said, the text didn't say that the beast killed with the sword and must be killed with the sword. The text says, he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. But Revelation chapter 13 verse 14 leaves no doubt that it's the beast who killed with the sword and in turn was killed with it. Now let's go to verse 14 now. Revelation chapter 13 verse 14 says, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So who was wounded by the sword? The beast was wounded by the sword. The beast used the sword to kill and the same sword that the, the beast used to kill was used against it and received a deadly wound. So, what is represented by the sword? 
According to the Bible, there are two swords. One sword was given to the church, which we'll see in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So what does this sword represent in the first instance? The sword is the word of God, the Bible. And to who did God give the sword? We know from our last session that this sword was given to the church. And how is the church to use this sword? By preaching the word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, is this the sword that the beast used to kill and that wounded the beast? No. It goes without saying that they cannot, um, that this cannot be the sword that wounded the beast at the end of the 1260 years because we are told explicitly that the very sword that the beast used to kill the saints during the 1260 years would be used to kill to be uh, that, that would be used to kill it at the end of this period but you could say but Habador, how do we know this wasn't the sword that was used well it's rather obvious that the papacy did not use the Bible during the 1260 years to kill protesters, meaning those that didn't go agree and go along with the system's belief and was that it was pushing on the people. Rather, it forbade the Bible. So the symbol of the sword in this context of Revelation chapter 13 must represent something different than what Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 says. The crucial question is this, which sword did the papacy use to persecute God's saints during the period of its supremacy? The answer is found in Romans 13. Romans chapter 13 verses 1 through 4 say, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers, meaning civil rulers, are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do you want do, do what is good? And you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Is there another sword besides the Word of God? Yes. The other sword is in the hand of the civil power. Is the sword that the civil power has in its hands the Bible? No. The sword is the authority given to the civil power to punish those that violate civil law. Not religious law, but civil law, as we studied last session. In the Bible, symbols are flexible. That is to say, they don't always have the same meaning. The context must dictate their meaning. The sword that is mentioned in Romans chapter 13 threatens civil penalties such as incarceration, confiscation of goods, fines, death against transgressors. This passage makes it clear that this sword does not belong to the church but rather to the state. The sword is punitive, not persuasive. It is important to realize that God has established both church and state. In God's order, they both have their legitimate place. Jesus announced that he will build this church upon himself when he said to Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church. As Matthew 16 verse 18 says, The church is God is Christ's spiritual kingdom. But Romans 13 also makes it very clear that the state 
was established by God. It even called God, it even called it God's minister. But the state is God's minister to punish violations of civil law, not religious law. Romans 13 explicitly affirms that the state is God's minister to preserve the civil authority of society. In the days of Paul, the sword was in the hand of the Roman Empire. Remarkably, Jesus refused to allow his followers, the initial church of that age, to use the temporal sword to defend his kingdom. When the mob came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, we are told that Peter drew his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. Peter, who was supposedly the first pope, was using the temporal soul, sword to defend his master's kingdom. But did Jesus encourage such behavior? Did he commend Peter for using the literal sword to defend his kingdom? Did he rebuke the other disciples for not following Peter's hero heroic example? Absolutely not. Jesus soundly rebuked Peter in words very similar to those of Revelation 13.10. So let's actually go to Matthew 26 verse 52. Matthew 26 verse 52 says, But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Now, let's go to Revelation 13.10 again. Revelation chapter 13 verse 10 says, He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. This is speaking of the literal sword of the state, which Jesus wanted nothing to do with, speaking of defending of his kingdom. Then a few hours later when Pilate asked Jesus if he was a king, Jesus promptly replied in John 18.36, Let's see what that says. John 18 verse 36 says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. They'd be fighting with the literal sword. But now my kingdom is not from here. So how many kingdoms did Jesus recognize? There were two kingdoms that Jesus said and that his kingdom was not of this world. If Jesus' kingdom was of this world, would his servants use what would his servants use to fight? They would be using the literal sword. But Jesus refused to allow his followers to employ the temporal sword to establish or to defend. His spiritual kingdom. So the question is, what is the deadly wound? We can only understand what the deadly wound is if we know what the sword that was used to give the deadly wound represents. Now that we know that the sword of Revelation 13 verse 10 represents the punishing power of the state to enforce civil laws, we must now seek to discover what is it meant by the deadly wound. A careful study of Revelation 13 verse 10 reveals that the deadly wound does not refer primarily to the confiscation of the territories of the Roman Catholic Church. Neither is it the elimination of the Roman Catholic Church as a church. The deadly wound was given to the papacy when the sword of the state that the papacy had to use to persecute God's people turned against it. The deadly wound then was the removal of the sword of the state from the hand of the papacy. So how did the papacy ob obtain the sword? Between the year 300 and the year 476, groups of barbarian tribes from the north invaded and carved up the Roman Empire. The last emperor was Romulus Augustulus, who was dis disposed in the year 476. The barbarian invasions into the Roman Empire turned it upside down and left it without a civil ruler who could preserve law and order. 
in the midst of this chaotic situation. The Bishop of Rome was enticed to take the reins of civil power. He was now not only the spiritual leader of the church, but also the civil ruler of the state. Cardinal Edward Manning described the manner in which the Roman pontiff originally gained his power. When the barbarians invaded the Roman Empire and tore it apart, Manning explains that the pontiffs found themselves alone the sole fountains of order, peace, and law, and safety, and from the hour of the provident, providential liberation, when by divine intervention, so he thought, the chains fell off from the hands of the successor of St. Peter, as once before from his own. No sovereign has ever reigned in Rome except the vicar of Jesus Christ. And that was Henry Edward, Henry Edward Manning from the temporal power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ. Now Manning further explains in more detail. It, referring to the papacy, waited until such a time as God should break its bonds asunder and should liberate it from subjection to civil powers and enthrone it in the possession of a temporal sovereignty of its own. He wrote that in the temporal power of the vicar of Jesus Christ. Manning is saying, when the civil power of Rome was removed by the barbarians, the bishop of Rome filled the vacuum and became the arbiter in the civil affairs as we as well as religious affairs. Remarkably, Manning refers this taking by the civil power by the, Rome, by the Bishop of Rome with expressions such as breaking bonds asunder and chains falling off. In cryptic language, the Apostle Paul had already referred to this removal of the civil power from the Roman Empire when he wrote about the removal of this mysterious restrainer in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 says, And now you know what is restraining, speaking of the civil power of the Roman Empire, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he now restrains, speaking the emperor, only he now that restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Revelation chapter 20 shows what captivity means. Bond with the chain, not able to use the kings of the nations to fulfill his purposes. After Roman another Roman Catholic theologian also affirms, Long ages ago, when Rome, through the neglect of the Western emperors, was left to the mercy of the barbarous hordes, the Romans turned to one figure for aid and protection and asked him to rule them. And thus, in this simple manner, the best title of all to kingly right commenced the temporal sovereignty of the popes, and meekly stepping to the throne of Caesar, the victor of Christ took up the scepter to which the emperors and kings of Europe were to bow in reverence through so many ages. That was James P. Conroy. He wrote that in American Catholic Quarterly review. And many of church historians have said the same. Here's another. Under the Roman Empire, meaning stage one, the Pope had no temporal powers. But when the Roman Empire had disintegrated, its place had been taken by a number of rude barbarous kingdoms. That's stage two. 
The Roman Catholic Church not only became independent of the state in religious affairs, but dominated secular, affair, secular affairs as well as stage three. Carl Conrad Eckert wrote that in the Papacy and World Affairs. Church historian R. W. Southern further explains the relationship between the papacy and the state during the Middle Ages. He wrote, During the whole medieval period, there was in Rome a single spirit and temporal authority, meaning the papacy, exercising powers, which in the end exceeded those that had even lain within the grasp of the Roman emperor. He wrote that in Western society and the church in the Middle Ages. Church historian John N. Figes adds to his testimony. In the Middle Ages, the church was not a state. It was the state, or rather, the civil authority for a separate society was not recognized, was merely the police department of the church. He wrote that from Gerson and Grotours, page 4. So what was the sword that the papacy used to kill the people? It wasn't the Bible. The Bible wasn't used to kill people. It was the sword of the civil power to accomplish its purposes, which it took over when the Roman Emperor fell. This idea of the church ruling in, in temporal as well as in spiritual affairs was fleshed out in 1302 when Pope Boniface VIII wrote a significant bull, meaning a personal letter, titled Unan Sactum. It said, We are informed by the text of the Gospels that in this church, speaking Roman Catholic Church, and its power are two swords. Now, question. How many swords did he say the Roman Catholic Church had? Two. How many swords does the Bible say the church has? One. Let us continue. We are informed by the text of the Gospels that in this church and in its power are two swords, namely the spiritual and the temporal. Both, therefore, are in the power of the church. That is to say, the spiritual and the material sword, but the former, meaning the spiritual sword, is to be administered for the church, but the latter, meaning the temporal, by the church. The former in the hands of the priest, the latter by the hands of the kings and soldiers, but, get this, but at the will and sufferance of the priest. Are you understanding what Revelation 13.10 is now saying when it says, He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword? If you understand that the church influenced the state to use the sword of the state, and this is the sword that was used to kill the saints of the Most High, put down an amen. I understand. Do you remember when we studied what happened to Jesus when he was sentenced to death by the religious power? But they couldn't carry out that sentence, could they? They needed the help of the civil power of the state to put Jesus to death. This is exactly what happened to many of Bible-believing Christians during the Dark Ages over and over again with the sword of the state that was now in the hands of the church. Now, what happened in 1798? How did the beast receive the deadly wound? If we know that the sword that was used to kill is the sword of the state, then that means the sword of the state would have to give the church the deadly wound. Just like Revelation 13 verse 10 says. Revelation chapter 13 verse 10 says, He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. The year 1798 marked the climax of the French Revolution that began about 1789. 
The revolution was an uprising against both kingly power and priestly intolerance. On February 12, 1798, General Berthier entered Vatican City and arrested Pope Pius VI, informed him that his power was at an end, and took him prisoner to France, where he died in exile. The Emperor Napoleon had already given the order that a successor not be elected. This is how the beast received the deadly wound. The papacy no longer had the authority to use the civil powers to accomplish her agenda. It is interesting to know how historians describe the deadly wound of 1798. They employ language very similar to that of Revelation 13. Let's take a few examples. First, George Trevor said in the book Rome from the Fall of the Western Empire, the papacy was extinct, not a vestige of its existence remained. Among all the Roman Catholic powers, not a finger was stirred in its defense because it no longer had the support of the state. The eternal city had no longer prince or pontiff. Its bishop was a dying captive in foreign lands, and the decree was already announced that no successor would be allowed in the place. George Trevor wrote that. That's in Rome from the fall of the Western Empire. Joseph Rickaby said in the lectures of the history of religion, specifically the modern papacy, that's volume 3, verse uh, page 1. It said, no wonder that half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed and that with the Pope, the papacy was dead. That's what Joseph Rickaby said. Now, T.H. Gill said in the book, The Papal Drama, multitudes imagined that the papacy was at the point of death and asked, would Pius VI be the last pontiff? And if the close of the 18th century would be signalized by the fall of the papal dynasty? T.H. Gill wrote that. Also, M. Whitloff was quoted in Frank B. Holbrook's Synopsis of, on Revelation. It said, The papacy has suffered its deepest humiliation and appeared to be annihilated. The revolution also dealt it the wound which it seemed did not want to heal until far into the 20th century. That's written in Symposium on Revelation. So one can't help but sense the irony of which took place in 1798. France is known as the eldest daughter of the papacy because Clavis, king of the Franks, was the first who officially gave the temporal power to the papacy in the year 508. Strikingly, the very nation that had first given the papacy the sword now turned on her mother and gave her the deadly wound. The French Revolution was a catastrophic event for the papacy. In the aftermath of the revolution, country after country in the Western world followed the example of France establishing democratic governments that proclaim their emancipation from the straitjacket of the papacy. But though the revolution was annihilated the papacy, prophecy foretells that she will arise from her deathbed far more powerful and oppressive than in the past. Revelation chapter 13 verse 3 describes the healing of the deadly wound. Revelation chapter 13 verse 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. How was the beast mortally wounded? 
with the same sword that it used to kill. Now, if the deadly wound is removing the sword from the hand of the beast, then how would the beast be healed? What is the healing of the papacy's deadly wound? Is it primarily the restoration of her confiscated territory? Is it the recovery of her ecclesiastical power? Not really. You see, the term papacy is a code word for religious political system that employs the power of the state to compel people to obey its dictates. In other words, the papacy is not merely, merely a church, but a union of church and state. If the deadly wound means that the state turned against the papacy and took away the sword from her in 1798, then the healing of the wound must mean that the state will once again give back to her the power of the sword that she lost in 1798. Are you getting this? So now let's ask, why hasn't the mortal wound healed yet? The late Malachi Martin, the Jesuit exorcist of the Roman Catholic Church and author of the best-selling book, The Keys of the Blood, said, get what year? Said in 1986, for 1500 years and more, Rome had kept as strong a hand as possible in each local community around the world, by and large and admitting some expectations that had been the Roman view until 200 years of inactivity, <clears throat> excuse me, of inactivity had been imposed upon the papacy by the major secular powers of the world. That was written in 1986. So what is it that keeps the deadly wound in place? The major secular powers of the world. Because they had not allowed the papacy to climb on them again. They haven't allowed the papacy to use them. Are we now starting to see that this is changing? Yeah. Even here in this country, we're starting to see changes. The church is trying to appeal to the state, trying to get her agenda across. If Malachi Martin wrote this statement in 1986, and that the Roman Catholic papacy has been inactive for 200 years, what he is saying is that the Roman Catholic papacy lost its power over the state around the time of 1786, which is around the time of the start of the French Revolution. Malachi Martin is saying that it's the French Revolution that enacted 200 years of inactivity upon the papacy, and that inactivity is now imposed by the secular powers of the world. Ellen White also agreed with Martin although she wrote, <laughs> she wrote about it a hundred years earlier. She said, let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed. Now, who imposes the restraints? The secular governments. Who imposed the restraints back in the time of the Roman Empire? The civil power. But when the civil power was removed, and the sword was given to the church, the chains fell off. The restrainer was gone. So when this beast receives the deadly wound, is the power to restrain the power restrained again by the secular powers of the world? Yes. As it says, let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed and Rome be reinstated in her former power, and there would speedily be a revival of her tyranny and persecution. That's written in Great Controversy, page 564. So what is it that keeps the deadly wound in place? The fact 
that the state doesn't allow itself to be used as the state was used during the Middle Ages or also known as the Dark Ages. In other words, the chains that fell off the hands of the papacy when the civil power of the Roman Empire fell in the 3rd and 4th centuries were slapped back on her hands in 1798. So when will the deadly wound be healed? When the sword the turned against the papacy, when will that arise to be given once again to the papacy to do what she did during the Dark Ages when she persecuted the saints of the Most High for 1260 years? Let me now read to you a statement by John W. Robbins, a Reformed theologian that agrees with both Martin and White. This was um, something that Ayn Rand quoted. Ayn Rand was right when she wrote in 1967, the Catholic Church has never given up the hope to reestablish, catch the word reestablish, meaning she must have had it and lost it, reestablished the medieval union of church and state with a global state and a global theocracy as its ultimate goal. The Roman church state is a hybrid, a monster of ecclesiastical and political power. Its political thought is totalitarian. And whenever it has had the opportunity to apply its principles, the result has been bloody repression. If during the last 30 years, it has softened its assertion of full, supreme, and irresponsible power and has murdered fewer people than before. Such changes in behavior are not due to a change in its ideas, but to a change in the circumstances, meaning the secular governments kept her at arm's length. The Roman church state in the 20th century, however, is an institution recovering from a mortal wound. And when it regains meaning, it must have lost it for it to regain it. And when it regains its full power and authority, it will impose a regime more sinister than any the planet has yet seen. The deadly wound will be healed at that point. John W. Robbins wrote that. So what's going to happen when the beast receives the sword of the state once again? It's going to have worldwide dominion and will persecute like it did in the past. No matter what it might appear, it might appear that it's something good right now. But a leopard can't change its spots. All this beast knows how to be is a dominating harlot that will kill anyone that goes against the wine she is giving to the world. Dave Hunt wrote in a book called A Woman Rides the Beast, which does contain a lot of error, but he got one thing straight, that the woman that rides the beast is the Roman Catholic Church and the beast represents the civil powers of the world. That's something he did get right in that book. Notice what Dave Hunt says in Global Peace, page 116. He wrote, why do world leaders want to go get in bed with the Vatican? Do you see the fornication metaphor? Why do they want to get in bed with the Vatican? The heads of state in today's world all recognize that the Pope wields a power which in many ways is even greater than their own. It is not only Catholicism's 900 million subjects and enormous wealth that causes the world's most powerful governments to cultivate friendly relations with the Roman Catholic Church. It is because Vatican City citizens 
are found in great numbers in nearly every country. They constitute an international network that reaches into the inside circles of the world's power centers. He wrote that in Global Peace, page 116. In his book, The Keys of This Blood, Malachi Martin, who by the way was a Jesuit priest that died under mysterious circumstances, described the competition for global control among three systems, capitalism, communism, and Roman, Roman Catholicism. He wrote, there is one great similarity shared by all three of these globalist competitors. Each one has in mind a particular grand design for world governance. Their geopolitical competition is about which of the three will form, dominate, and run the world system that will replace the decaying nation system. Malachi wrote this in the keys of this blood, page 18. Martin harbors no doubts about who will win in this tooth and nail competition. It's going to be the Roman Catholic papacy. And Martin describes in chilling words what will happen when the papacy regains its power. Notice what he says. No holds barred because once the competition has been decided, the world and all that's in it, our way of life as individuals and as citizens of the nations, our families and our jobs, our trade and commerce and money, our educational systems and our religions and cultures, even the badges of our national identity, which most of us have always taken for granted, all will have been powerfully and radically altered forever. No one can be exempted from its effects. No sector of our lives will remain untouched. No one who is acquainted with the plans of these three rivals have any doubt but that only one of them will can win. Malachi Martin wrote this in the keys of his blood. How does that make you feel? What is the objective of the papacy? It's world dominance by once again sitting on the civil powers of the world to dominate and control as she did in the past. One could say, well, she sounds nice now. She's calling for peace, you know, always looking out for the common good of all. Yeah, this sounds good right now, but no disrespect towards anybody, but that's how the devil works. The devil don't work openly. He's behind the scenes working in darkness. He makes evil look good, and he could also make good look evil. Now, what is the time frame for this geopolitical new world order under the leadership of the Roman Catholic papacy? When will this take place? Let's go back to Malachi Martin and his book, The Keys of His Blood, pages 15 and 16. It says, As to the time factor involved, those of us who are under 70 will see at least the basic structures of the new world government installed. Those of us under 40 will surely live under its legislative, executive, and judiciary authority and control. Malachi Martin wrote this. There is nothing hidden in this book. The keys of this blood written by Malachi Martin, it openly tells us what the objective of the Roman Catholic Church is. He also said that there is no human being that can prevent this from happening. The crucial question is this, how will the papacy regain the power of the sword that it lost over 200 years ago? 
Who will loosen the chains that have restrained the system for the last two centuries? Even more, what nation in the world would be foolish enough to place the sword once again in the hand of such a cruel power? Prophecy reveals that the sword of the civil power will be restored to the papacy with the aid of the most unlikely of nation. So, don't miss this exciting session to come. This next exciting session is called Revelations Beast of the Earth. Let us close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us very clearly through your word. Lord, we ask you to guide us. We ask you to protect us. I pray in Jesus' name that those that still haven't heard the gospel, that they hear it, that they heed your final message to come out of her. For Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Lord, I pray that people's ears be open to hear in truth as it is written in your holy word. Lord Jesus, I ask that we be filled with the Holy Spirit so we can fully understand when we open up the Bible, prompt everyone that has heard this message to open up the Bible and read for themselves what it is that you have written in there, what it is that you have warned us of, for you do not do anything without letting us, for you do not leave us in darkness. Thank you, Jesus, for the Bible that is a lamp a light unto our path. Thank you, Jesus, for not leaving us astray, for you were always with us. Lord, I ask that the Spirit of truth continue to guide us to all truth, just as your word says. I ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.